Hi, this is Horace Cordier, and you are watching Rock and Hard Place. This is our first episode, and this will be a hard rock and heavy metal podcast show where we discuss albums. Sometimes we'll review albums. Sometimes we'll talk about all sorts of things. But tonight, we are going to go through the Blue Oyster Cult catalog, and it's going to be a ranking show, so it's going to be worst to best. And with me tonight is my good friend, John, who's as big a BOC fan as I am, and we actually met at a Blue Oyster Cult concert. So without further ado, let's get to it. John, what is your least favorite canon Blue Oyster Cult album? Uh, my least favorite Blue Oyster Cult album is actually uh, Curse of the Hidden Mirror. So that's the, their last album from 2001. Uh, that's my number 13. Uh, and before I do that, I just want to say that I actually looked up when that BOC show was. That was actually January 26, 2007 at BB King's. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons why I love this band is because, you know, most people know them from the hits, right? Uh, Don't Be the Reaper, Godzilla, Burning For You. Uh, but at that show, they pulled out She's As Beautiful As A Foot. Yes. Like deep album cut from the first album, which they hadn't played since the 70s. I don't and think they've played it since the 70s. That's right, yeah. That's why I love this band is because they have such a rich, deep catalog um, beyond the hits. Yes. So and every time you see them live, I've seen them three times with you since then. Yeah, uh, and I've seen them actually six times. And every time I've seen them, except for the very first time I saw them, which was in the 80s, they've always played at least one strange deep cut. And on that night, it was She's As Beautiful As A Foot. Yeah, great, great track. So we'll, we'll get to that album, uh, I, I'm assuming. It's we certainly will. To both of our lists, yeah. Also, let me tell everybody, we simply could not, we don't have physical copies on hand, or as you can see from all the stuff behind here, I couldn't find them. We're going to hold up the album covers as we do them, but we don't have physical copies of two of the Blue Oyster Cult albums, which are Curse of the Hidden Mirror and um, Heaven Forbid. I have them. I just didn't have time to find them. But all the other albums will hold up so we know exactly what we're talking about. So yeah. that's why you're not seeing. And by the way, mine is the same. That is also my least favorite. Okay. So, so we'll just talk about it. I mean, for me, I mean, one of the things about this album is that I like it. Um, it's a good right. record. Um, however, uh, the balance between songs that I think are really standout and ones that are kind of forgettable are, are kind of 50-50. So I really like The Old God's Return. Uh, I really like um, Out of the Darkness. It's kind of got a cool sort of mood to it. Yeah. Just don't love the Buck Dharma song. Uh, it's really poppy, catchy, accessible. That's great. Uh, and Eye of the Hurricane, I really like. Those are the ones that sort of jump out at me. Uh, interestingly enough, the two singles, Dance on Stilt and Pocket, I think are some of the weaker songs on the album. Um, yeah. Uh, my, my take on the album is that it, uh, it's, it's kind of disjointed mm. and I actually like a couple of things on it, but I have a very, I have a soft spot for Buck when he goes pretty poppy. So I actually like Pocket, which is a pop song as far as I'm concerned. It mm. honestly, Pocket is the kind of song that could have been on Buck's solo album flat out. It's that poppy. Um, but it's just, it's, the album is just missing a lot of what I consider to be the classic BOC magic. I mean, at this point, you know, Al and Joe were long gone. Um, it's about the same as, as uh, it, it even has less of the mojo of even something like Club Ninja because, because Alan Lanier wasn't even with them anymore at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's just, it kind of, it's sort of there. Um, and just by Blue Oyster Cult standards, it's also not as, and also when it tries to be sort of uh, extra strange and esoteric, I feel like it's a little bit of a pastiche, like it's trying just a little too hard mm -hmm. to sort of catch, um, catch the old vibe. But yeah, it's just. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if that's uh, Shirley's lyrics. I mean, John Shirley has, has sort of uh, picked up the mantle for lyric writer, uh, starting with the last album and then this one as well. I would and, agree, except that Shirley's lyrics are quite strong if you like them on Heaven Forbid. I just, think, I don't know. It's hard. Yeah, and it's kind of cool that they sort of name check an old Stock Forest group song in the title of the album, right? Sort of self-referential, Curse of the Hidden yeah, Mirror. And, it, and it, has, it, has, it has a great album cover, as opposed to the one before it, which is a much stronger record, in my opinion, but has the worst BOC album cover. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to show it to you, but that's heaven forbid, and it's terrible. Uh, but, you know, we have, we're going to try to keep the shows on the shorter side, so we don't want to spend too much time on each album, especially uh, the lower. We could we could probably do an entire show on just like one we could album. Do an entire show on an individual <laughs> album, but we did decide we were going to rank it, so we will move on to the next one. And just so everybody knows the format, we're just going back and forth. So it goes from John to me, back and forth. Uh, okay, so for my second least favorite Blue Oyster Cult album, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go with Uga Chuga. 
one. <laughs> now, I actually listened to this album not that long ago. And I mean, I, I'm fair, you know, full disclosure, I listened to the I listened to the entire DOC catalog pretty regularly. So nothing's gone all that long without me listening to it. But I gave this one a serious listen much more recently than usual. And it's actually a much better record than I tended to give it credit for back in the day. Back in the day, I was holding it up against the classics. And, you know, it has that kind of new wave production. Um, it's, you know, two oyster cults was the joke in the day because it's just, it's really the first album that's just fucking bloom. Um, and there's like Tommy Zujavec on keyboards. So there's a number of weak tracks on it, but there's some pretty good stuff on it, including, uh, you know, Dancing in the Ruins, which I think is like a great worshipful pop song. And When the War Comes is kind of interesting. Mm. Shadow Warrior, not bad. And the whole album is pretty, pretty cohesive, but it's just by the standards of Glorious the Cult, it's nowhere near the top of the game. So what's your take on this one? Uh, well, I'll talk about that one soon, but my number 12 is actually Heaven oh, Forbid. Right. Yeah, Heaven Forbid is my number 12. And I, me. I do like this album, aside from the terrible album cover. But for me, it suffers for the same problems that Curse of the Hidden Mirror has in that I think half the album is really strong. I think half of the album is kind of forgettable. And um, the album is also front loaded with all of its strongest tracks. So See You in Black is really heavy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As is Power Underneath Despair. Um, and hammer back, and then Harvest Moon is one of Buck's greatest ballads. I mean, it's a really haunting. Harvest Moon is fantastic. Yeah, really haunting, great song live. It's also you know it's, it's fantastic live. Uh, X Ray Eyes is really fun, right? Uh, I also like um, Damaged as well. Um, the problem with me is that the, for, for this album, for me, why I rank it slightly? Well, I rank it slightly ahead of uh, the previous album um, that I mentioned is because I think the peaks here are stronger. So I think those first four or five tracks are stronger than the good songs on Curse of the Hidden Mirror, but I think it suffers from the same kind of inconsistency. Uh, I think the album really flags in its second half. I mean, it ends with a sort of a cover of Indie, so it's like almost like it kind of runs out of gas towards the end. Yeah, that was um, always a strange thing because it was sort of listed, uh, I remember when I bought the CMC CD, um, In Me was listed as a bonus track. And this was if people are not remembered at, at this era in the 90s, you know, the bonus track was often just on every version of the album, but for whatever bizarre reason, the record label would just label some random track. Oh, this is the bonus track. Yeah. So That's I, I like it. So it's okay. Yeah, I like it. Um, I just don't think it's as strong as, um, as as what came before it. And of course, uh, by this part, by, by this point, it is really just um, Eric and, and and Buck. So it's just the two of them at this point. It right? is Eric and Buck. Um, I will um, I will get I will get to uh, I will get to heaven forbid later in my list because I'm actually a lot fonder of it than you are. Uh, but I think part of the reason why it splits a lot of DOC fans is it's probably in some respects the most overtly metal Bluish the Cult album. And strangely enough, kind of like Finn Lizzie's Thunder and Lightning, some Bluish the Cult fans don't like that very metallic. They think that that's a little forced and that's not the true DOC sound because DOC were never really considered uh, a heavy metal band. They were considered a hard rock band that dabbled in a little metal, but they weren't heavy metal like Black Sabbath. And there are moments like See You in Black and things like that on that album that are just metal. It's almost like it could be a Metallica song. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so so my next one up, which uh, John and I would certainly split on this. Uh, and keeping in mind, now any album that I'm getting into is an album that I really, really like because I like most of the Bruce Cole catalog, but I'm sorry, I got to go with Maginos, which I like a lot, but it's got some deficiencies and it's it's a weird album it's we could do an entire show on this that would take three hours but the whole history of this is that it was essentially supposed to be an al bouchard solo album and uh the record label decided that they wanted it to be a boc album and there's like thirty five thousand people to play on this thing. um and it was out of print for many years etc cetera, etc cetera. uh sound wise it's a really adventurous album it has a lot of really great uh, interesting stuff on it. It suffers a little bit from a very classic 80s production. It's very thick, kind of loud. And it also has some strange things, like my favorite song on it is the song about Baron Frankenstein, which actually has a guest vocalist. Um, yeah. And it's a completely insane, you know, like uh, I think it's Stuttering John from the Howard, Howard Stern show or something. Um, I, I don't even know who the hell does the vocalist. Also, Mark Biederman from Blind Illusion. There's like 50,000 guitars. But there's a lot of great stuff on here. Uh, the remake of Astronomy is fantastic. The Frankenstein song is fantastic. The song 
where we used to call it the Spamcaster. Um, in the Presence of Another World is another great, mysterious, and I love, just love that artwork, you know, like the flash of lightning. This has the old BOC feel. Um, mm. But once again, I don't think Alan Lanier is on it. I think it's it's also a two Oyster Cults uh, mm. production or 99 Oyster Cults. But that's the next one on my list. Mm. Oh. All right. Um, well, my number 11 is um, an album you already mentioned. It's uh, Club Ninja, mm -hmm. the much maligned Club Ninja, I'll say. Uh, I actually like this record. Uh, it is commercial, um, but I think it's fun. Uh, aside from the Uga Chakas on When the War Comes, <laughs> which are just ridiculous, if you take those out of the song, uh, it's kind of a moody kind of piece that's kind of like fits in with that sort of BOC kind of warped sensibility. Yes. Uh, Madness to the Method is also kind of a weak closing track, but other than that, I mean, I really love the material on this. Perfect Water is a great pop tune, right? Um, Perfect White Water Black. to a lot of people is the strongest uh, song on the album. And people yeah. are, may have forgotten this, Jim Carroll wrote the lyrics for that yeah. of, of uh, you know, Catholic boy theme. So it has very literate lyrics. Yeah, uh, Perfect Water is great. I, I like White Flags and Dancing in the Ruins. I think they're great pop tunes. Um, White Flags, even, great Canadian cover version. I even like Spy in the House of the Night and uh, Shadow Warrior. I mean, I think, they, I think they're fun. I think, it's a, I, think it's a fun um, I think it's a fun album and it has a little bit of a new wave feel. I like yeah. it. That's a little bit of a new wave feel. Um, but yeah. And, and I'll finally say that, I mean, there's a song called Make Rock Not War, which is about as silly as it sounds, but it's ridiculous, but it's also fun. It's as opposed to a, as opposed to a song that I'm going to mention in, 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 a, in a few moments, I know. Uh, which is ridiculous and terrible. But uh, aside from sort of, I, I mean, I just think it's a good album. I think it's underrated. Yeah. And we won't mention the terrible Lee Aaron cover, uh, which is Beat Em Up. It's kind of bright. I kind of, I kind of, I kind one, of, of the, one of the weakest. I, I, well, I like the cover. I think the cover sort of like, you know, Star Trek meets Blues the Cult. Yeah. It fits the kind of like, uh, uh, the, the kind of feel of the album. Yeah. Anyway, that's my that's number 11. Yeah. That's your number 11. All right. So my next one is now we're into the stuff that I generally consider to be just good stuff. Um, yep. But it's going to be The Revolution by Night. Which mine too. That's my number two as well. Same, we're on the same page here. So here's my take on this one. Uh, this is a this is a sort of a momentous album that Blue Oyster Cult uh, canon because it's the first one without Al Bouchard, who was such a crucial part of the classic early material. Uh, mm -hmm. Al sang, he sang cities on flame with rock and roll. He wrote a lot of the greatest lyrics. I mean, we could spend all day talking about Blue Oyster Cult's army of lyricists. They had the best in the business. Um, you know, he's a great Cole. drummer too. Yeah. Beat poets and Sandy Perlman and all these cool New York, uh, New York avant-garde uh, characters. Uh, but Al was a huge creative force in the band. So after the disastrous Donington show and all the problems that they had on the tour uh, for Fire of Unknown Origin, he was out and the drum tech, who's a guy named Rick Downey, came in to play drums. And that this is the first result of that album. Now, now I like almost all of the songs on this album. And I find that the primary problems on this album are Bruce Fairbairn, who was a very lightweight AOR producer. And we're not talking heavy AOR like Foreigner. We're talking paper weight, paper light AOR, like, I don't know, Bon Jovi or something. So there's, there's this very, and also this was the era of the gated drum. So the drum sound is terrible. There's, there's a lightness to the production that doesn't really help Blue Oyster Cult. Um, but the songwriting is there, and starting with uh, "Take Take Me Away," which is a great rocker. Um, this has one of the great mellow blues you songs, which is "Shooting Star," which yep. kind of puts you to sleep, it's like mesmerizing. Um, and then there's some silly but fun stuff, like you know the Headless Horseman song, which is the one with the, the, the you know the, the bikers, the headless bikers riding yeah. at night. Um, and I don't remember "Dragon Lady" is you know, and then you have like "Light Years of Love," which is sort of pop AOR. So it's a light Blue Oyster Cult album, but it definitely holds a little bit of the old BOC mystery. And I have to say, it's a pretty impressive showing considering that Al was not involved in the result. Yeah, I mean, I have to echo a lot of those comments. I mean, well, first off, I love this back cover, which is very sort of Lovecraftian, right? It's Lovecraftian great... and also H.R. Geiger. Yeah. It's sort of uh, like a cross between Lovecraft and Alien. Take Me Away is great, great riff. That's, a, that's an Aldo Nova Take Me Away is fantastic. Song. Yeah, that's great. And also has, for those of you who want to, check out the incredibly cheesy but very entertaining vintage video 
Yeah. Like they're all on like a soccer field about to be abducted by aliens while wearing their nice Louis clothes. I love uh, Eyes on Fire. I think it's a great. Oh, uh, I just thought it was good. I didn't even think of that one. That's like a good. Oh, yeah. Eyes on Fire. Yeah, no, it's great. That's great. I like Veins. Um, Dragon Lady's fun. Uh, the only two songs I don't like are, I think, the Light Years of Love suffers sort yeah, of. The Light Years of Love is probably the weakest song on the album, but the songwriting is generally pretty strong. Well, I mean, it's it's like Madness in the Method. It sort of ends the album on kind of a kind of a weak note. I mean, up at this time and definitely the album before it, uh, BOC had this sort of tendency of really ending the album on kind of like a quirky sort of mellowish note. Yeah. You know, for a band that was often referred to as like the thinking man's heavy metal sort of band, uh, they would often end the albums with these kind of like moody, mellow sort of numbers. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I think like when we get to some of the albums, a couple of them have very, very classic. Yeah, I think I think Light Years is too is is just doesn't have that. But for me, the the the, the most egregious sort of error on this album is Let Go, which for me is <laughs> <laughs> unlike Unlike uh, Make Rock Not War, I just think it's just ridiculous. Yeah, and you know what, I, 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 you know, this is an epic fight that we've had for years, and I, I decided to like not even mention it when I talked about the album because I had a feeling that you would bring it up. Uh, <laughs> Let Let Go is completely ridiculous, but I find it extremely entertaining, and that's the song for anybody that forgets that, that actually has a, a lyric that says B O C. You can be what you want to be, and apparently. <laughs> Eric Bloom thought this was like the coolest shit ever. And Buck Darm and the rest of the band were like, oh my God, that's horrible. So they were like, he wanted for the singer. Well, I, well, I remember reading this in Martin Popoff's uh, great uh, sort of band uh, book. Yeah, Martin Popoff's books on blues are called Definite Must Buys for BOC. He, 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 I think he says that uh, Eric wanted to call the song Blue Oyster Cult and it was sort of voted down by the rest of the band members. So, yeah, it's uh, a anyway, I like um, um, Aside from Let Go, I like the album. I think it's really strong. This is my number I 10. I have a feeling we were going to mix it up on Let Go. I think Let Go is as dumb as a bag of wet hammers, cardboard bag of wet hammers, but it's entertaining. You don't think it's entertaining. You're a make rock, not war guy. All right. Okay, next. Moving on. <laughs> Me or you? I guess, um, I, guess I, I guess I'll go next and cause a little bit of controversy. My number nine pick uh, is Agents of Fortune, uh, which is which would probably shock a lot of people, but uh, I don't I don't rank it this low because I don't like because I because I don't like the album. I just think that everything else is that much stronger. Um, and for me, I mean, right, you know, it's the, it's the album that has their biggest hit on it, right? Don't fear the reaper. Right. Heard it many times. Uh, for me, the strongest track is uh, the Revenge of Vera Gemini, which has got this great sort of Patti Smith um, vocal on it. Uh, oh, where, I, oh, I absolutely agree. That's in my top five Blue Oyster Cult song. Yeah, uh, I really like Sinful Love as well. Um, Morning finals are really cool, sort of like uh, Morning story final, the ending suite, the ending songs are kind of interesting because it's sort of like yeah. like mellow or um, but it has a fan favorite with the metal fans that I've never been all that crazy about, which is Tattoo Vampire, which I like, but I don't think it's that great. And everybody's like, oh, it's blues to call the most metal song. Do you know if, if anybody likes that song, I really recommend searching uh, on YouTube. There's actually um, Albert's demo of that song, yeah. and it has it's much less heavy. It's much sort of quirkier. I would sort of probably track. prefer that. Weirdly enough, yeah. as well versus I am in BOC, I have not heard Albert's demos. Yeah, well, that, that it's it's just interesting to see, see that that uh, you know seeing you know BOC one of these uh, bands where often the demos and what the songs became after they worked on it in the studio are often quite sort of different. So uh, I like the album a lot. Uh, True Confessions, I think, is a weak track. Uh, this ain't the summer of love is good, but kind of simple. Um, and uh, you know. Tenderloin's all right. I mean, it's like it's like the, the, the highs on this album are really high. Uh, I just think there are one or two songs on it there that keep it yeah. below some of their other albums. Yeah. So we'll that's kind of nine, an album I really like, but I've never really embraced the way that sort of a lot of the masses have. And I mean, it's their first album also after the, the black and white period. And so it has that sort of- um, it's, a, just, like, it's, a, it's the beginning it, of the next era. Um, yeah, it's a so very it's, songwriting, right? You start to see all the individual band members start to come forward with their with their own material, right? As opposed to sort of like a more unified whole in the previous um, three albums. And it sort of reminds me a lot of um, Queen's album, News of the World, right? Where it's sort of very distinct individual statement. You have a Freddie Mercury track, you have a Bernie yeah. May track. And Queen even had that a little bit in the early days to do a little bit more music. Yeah, it's just, it, but it's, it's, it's no News of the World. So it's, it's number nine, I like it a lot. I just don't love it. So what's your we number? To, if we don't want this to go an hour and a half, we'll have to pick up the pace a little bit. 
Um, okay, so mine, and I'll make it quick. My next one is the one that I don't have the album cover for, which is Heaven Forbid, which I actually consider to be a lot stronger album than most people do. It was actually very well received when it came out. Um, but, you know, it was the first Blue Oyster Cult studio album in many, many years. Um, and we've already touched on it and talked about it a few times. But what I like about it is that it was, uh, you know, pretty well realized. The band were uh, committed. It has some good songwriting. John Shirley is a slightly divisive figure in BOC circles. I like his lyrics, but, you know, there used to be a joke that John Shirley just couldn't write enough songs about getting shanked in prison. Um, <laughs> so there's like two songs about dudes getting out of prison on uh, heaven forbid, power beneath the stair, and the name of the second one escaped me. But somebody was like, if, if it's a dude getting shivved in prison, it's a John Shirley here. Um, so, you know, some of that's a little macho over the top, but I happen to dig it. And uh, I like when they did their sort of more metal moments like see her and see you in black. Uh, see her and see you in black, right? See you, not her. See you in black, I think is fantastic. I don't mind the indie remake, uh, but power underneath the stair. There are a couple of very bad songs, like. Speaking of which, I just want to be bad is kind of terrible. Uh, <laughs> but I think overall, it's a, it's, a, it's a remarkably strong late period album. I think that's all I can say about it. And we did talk about it a little bit earlier. So I guess I'll leave it on that. Do you want to, do you want to, you go first on number eight. Oh, What's I'm going to go eight? first on number eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, now we're in my controversial pick, which is now as we, as we close in, my number eight. Is a very beloved BOC album that's never really quite 100% done it for me, and that's Spectres, which a lot of people actually rate. Some people rate this as their favorite BOC album. Um, it's a great album. It has some great stuff on it, but I think some of the stuff drags. I'm not a huge fan of Fireworks. Um, that Ian Hunter song, Going Through the Motions, kind of goes through the motions. Um, I just don't know. There's something about it. I feel like it's a little disjointed. It's a little lighter. Um, it's not as cohesive. I always feel like Agents of Fortune is the new chapter, the new era, and they really just sort of brought it all together. Um, even though, as John correctly noted, you have everybody sort of writing off on their own tangent. But it just seems a little less jokey, if that's a word. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's also things on Spectres. Uh, I think Godzilla is a very entertaining song, but I think it's kind of a silly trifle in many ways. And I think it really comes into its own as a live song. Um, as opposed to the studio version of Godzilla, really doesn't do that much for me. Um, mm -hmm. Now that said, the spoken word stuff with the Japanese train conductors and the guy—it's hilarious. Uh, but you know, if you've ever heard BOC live, and they were such a great—they are such a great live band. Uh, that was always a showstopper because of Eric's hilarious uh, raps about you know, oh no, Tokyo, I hear something coming, there's something rumbling. I mean, <laughs> uh, so that's my controversial pick. I'm not the hugest fan of Spectres. All right. All right. Oh, and and. Uh, there is one of my top five Blue Oyster Cult songs on here, which is Golden Age of Leather, which is absolutely A plus, but mm. it still ranks lower than most for me. All right. Well, my number eight is Mirrors, uh, an album which I really like. Uh, it was, was called Errors when it first came out because oh, it was that's right. Song, right? Um, but, you know, actually, there's a lot of great stuff on here. I mean, I think the, the great Sun Jester uh, has a uh, Michael Moorcock sort of helped write the lyrics to that one. I think it's really great. Um, Indy is the big hit, right? Um, Moon Crazy is really fun. Uh, the Vigil is one of BOC's best songs. The Vigil by serious BOC fans is considered one of the. I know, I know, uh, uh, you know, Martin Papa, the, the, the hard rock writer. I think, I, I think that might be. He might consider that BOC's greatest song. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I am the storm is a great. I mean, I've always wondered why I'm a metal fan band. Of I am the storm. I've always wondered why a metal band hasn't covered that because it's a really great rock. Well, I've also wondered in general why Blue Oyster Cult is rarely covered by any metal band. They really don't tend to be a band that gets covered. Um, I think Lonely Teardrops is one of the, that great example of what I mentioned before about a really kind of mellow um, song to sort of end well, the I love Lonely Teardrops. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's got sort of like a travelogue quality to it. I always think of like a highway, got like the highway from the cover. I always think of that when I listen to that song. I think it's the way that it sort of fades out. I really love it. Um, the only song I sort of, uh, I, I think doesn't match up to everything else is, um, I'm not the one you warned me of, which is basically a Cars, uh, pastiche, uh, that oh, was written. I'm by, not the one you warned me of. It's, uh, I'm yeah. not the one you're looking for. I'm not the one you're looking for. I'm sorry. I'm not the one you warned me. <laughs> That's on, uh, imagine. What you warn me for? <laughs> uh, you're not the one I was looking for, which Albert wrote, uh, and I think, 
uh, references the producer, right? Uh, he was not happy during the making of this album. He thought that it was a mistake to go so pop, right? And so he wrote this song that was like a piss take uh, where he sort of like basically very self-consciously copies uh, the car song, right? Uh, You're just what I needed. And um, it, it's it's sort of, for that reason, it's my least favorite, but I do love the record. I think it's a it's a gorgeous sounding record. I find record. that song enormously amusing. And I feel like the album is coherent enough that I can, I can, I can put up with one sort of joke song. Yeah. So, so that's my uh, number eight. That's your number eight. Okay. So my next one is, uh, which, which is also going to be a lot lower uh, for most people, though not as low as John, and it is probably going to be, uh, let's see, I think it, I think it is. I think it's going to be the Apes of Fortune. Uh, now, <laughs> I love the album. I like it a lot more than John does. And it's funny because one of the things that John doesn't like about it, also I love the artwork. The artwork. Yeah, that's great. Phenomenal. That's a, that's a great um, is I love uh, I love the doo-wop song. I love the Alan Lanier doo-wop song, um, True Confessions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always loved to save the summer of love because I like the fact that the album sort of starts off sinister. Um, it's got a little bit, even though it's a bridge from the black and white era, they wisely chose something that was a little dark to open the album so that you're not totally thrown into the deep end of like, you know, something as mellow as Tenderloin or something. Um, mm-hmm. Right off the bat, you're like, okay, there's still a little of the the incense BOC evil of old, uh, but it's it's not the dark hearted beast of the black and white era. Uh, but I just think it's a beautifully balanced album. Uh, I also have a very personal story about it, which is before I even bought records, because I'm older, so I was 10 years old and my parents left me somewhere and I went into a black white record store where they were selling like, probably in those days they sold hash and you know, it's like probably they're probably selling drugs by the counter. But I remember I walked in and I was a little kid, I didn't know anything about music. And they had a huge black light agents of fortune, one of those tapestries hanging from like, and I just remember looking at it being like, oh, that's so cool, the magician. And so the, the imagery has always been incredibly, but we've talked a lot about the album so far. And I would echo a lot of what John said about it, which is that I just, uh, I, I think it's an amazing album. I love all the different flavors and songwriting. There's mellower things on it that I really love. I love the Subway song. It's really some of Joe Bouchard's best writing is on this. Um, mm-hmm. Morning Final is a great, weird, creepy song. You always talk about that crazy, not that crazy about Debbie Denise. I know a lot of people love it. Um, but it's just the stuff, the, the stuff that I rank higher, I just like better. That doesn't mean I don't love the album. All right, over to you. All right. Well, my number seven is uh, Spectres. Spectres. Um, I actually. Fireworks going off in her hand. I actually bought this uh, the same time that I bought Agents of Fortune, and I think it really solidified why I think this is a superior album. It just seemed more consistent to me. Uh, it's got a great sort of warm production. Um, I, I mean, I think that that just like the writing on here, right, is a bit more consistent all the way through. Uh, Death Valley Nights is one of my favorite Blue Oyster Cult songs. Um, yeah, that would have been my other, that would have been, I didn't mention that when I talked about it, but that would have been one of my other highlights on the album. Yeah, and I love, I mean, the Searching for Celine's got that sort of like disco beat, but it kind of works, right? Uh, Are You Ready to Rock is a great sort of like live. Are You Ready to Rock I like, but I feel like it found found its feet as a live number. It's a great live album. But yeah, no, I mean, I I don't dislike the album. Mm -hmm. For me, for me, and also the the, the final two tracks, right? I Love the Night uh, with its sort of like crypto vampire theme, which, which becomes more apparent when you hear the full length version, right? That final verse was sort of cut out for space considerations, but it actually is like a vampire song. When they play it live, they, they sometimes they add that last verse in there. And of course, Nosferatu is like, is like sort of like a really cool sort of vampire sort of like uh, uh, a track. So, I mean, uh, for me, uh, my number seven, Spectres, I think it's a fantastic sort of- Yeah, uh, you know, that I think about version of Agent realize how much vamp- there's a lot of vampire there's a lot of vampire in the BOC catalog because of yeah. vampire. Yeah. So it's me now. Yep, number six. So now as we close in on all the really good stuff, I'm going to go with the one we talked about and I'll keep free, uh, Mirrors, which is one of my all-time favorite Bluish Cult albums. It's the Bluish Cult album that I bought last. I was intimately familiar with the rest of the catalog except for the latest stuff. Um, and for some strange reason, I just didn't hear it until maybe 10 years ago, which is, which is or maybe now 15 years ago. But considering I've been listening to the other album for decades before that, I don't know why. And I think probably because I was a metal guy and I heard it was really poppy and light and it was called Errors. And even though I love AOR, like Foreigner, I was like, do I really want light foolish to call? But why it took me longer to get to this than the Revolution by Night, I have no idea. 
But when I did get to it, it's just a great one. And even though it's uh, poppier and lighter, it's, it's beautifully produced. I actually love Tom Worman's production. He has a lighter touch, but it works perfectly for the album. And I think there's some real like heavy stuff on this. I mean, um, I Am The Storm is, you know, it's a metal in execution, it's a metal in lyric. Uh, and I love everything else on it, right down to Al Bichard's completely ridiculous cars. So <laughs> this is an album that I come back to all the time and I never have a bad time with it. And I like every single song on it. So, yeah. Great. Um, my number six is uh, the, the debut, Blue Oyster Cult. I know, uh, doesn't, get, doesn't make my top five, I love it. Um, I think there's so many great uh, tracks on here, uh, right? Transmaniac Con AC is a great sort of opening salvo for the band, right? Really clever lyrics, uh, really cool sort of like descending guitar riff. Um, and I love, a statement uh, of intent Yeah, the band's entire career, A+. Plus. I love, you know, obviously Cities on Flame is the big is the big sort of hit song on here, but I love tracks like Workshop, The Telescopes, um, Stairway to the Stars, Before the Kiss of Red Cap has a cool sort of like structure where it sort of starts off almost like a blues track and then it becomes like an uh, like a buck sort of pop tune before going back to blues. Yeah, it's a really great meld of the buck and the bloom dynamic together. Yeah, and it's 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 it's. It, it just, it, it's an album that sort of sounds like it looks, right? The whole kind of like creepy package of like outer space. The production is sort of like kind of spacey and weird. And uh, the album is sort of um, basically for a band that was basically signed and uh, envisioned initially, right? In this form, in Blue Oyster before the, the, the previous iterations as the American answer to Black Sabbath. I mean, this is sort of uh, kind of cool, occulty, weird, strange, Right. And also uh, distinctly, uh, distinctly science fiction and high tech, as opposed to Black Sabbath's medieval witch and, you know, the water and the whole, the first Black Sabbath album cover is utterly iconic, but it's a totally different vibe than Gallic's, uh, that's the, the, the artist, than Gallic's vision for the first Blues to Cold album, which is just chrome yeah. and steel. And that's my number six. Just just misses my top five, but I, I love it dearly. So uh, great, great debut for the band. Right. Okay, so my number six, and keeping in mind, I love all of these albums. So anything that I'm talking about now is an album that I totally love, but number six has got to be number six. And it is Fire of Unknown Origin, which is a lot of people's favorite Blues to Cult album. Um, why is it number six? Well, it's number six because there's the whole black and white era that we got to deal with. But... As an album, this is an amazing record. I can't think of a single song on it that I don't like. And I remember when I was younger, I thought some of the mellower songs like The Closer, Don't Turn Your Back. I was like, oh, it's an okay song, but it's too mellow. Now those are some of my favorite songs on the album because one of the things that makes it such a great album is it's, is it's laid out beautifully. So, you know, you love the beginning. It starts energetic. It ebbs, it flows, and it's just that last song, it's like the tide sort of rolling out um, after you've had this almost perfect listening experience. And also this has Vengeance the Pact, which is one of those great story songs where you can actually picture like, you know, some guys on a horseback with like bows and arrows and they're hunting somebody. And, you know, it's a, it's a, a story song, but it's a great story. And of course the hits are fantastic. I mean, Burning For You is a prime AOR hit, everything that a good hit should be, catchy and memorable. Honestly, there isn't a bad song on this album. So that's that's my number six. All right, uh, top five. Uh, my number five is Imaginos. Uh, I, I love this record. Um, I know a lot of people don't consider it a BOC record, right? It started off as an Al Bouchard solo project. It's as much a BOC record as having for bits of BOC record. So. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I remember when I first got into BOC, I bought a compilation from Columbia called Workshop of the Telescopes. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it had a really great booklet. And it, the first CD was basically the black and white era. Uh, the second CD was all everything afterwards. And I remember the discography in the booklet and the liner notes referenced this album, but there were no tracks. There were no tracks. Were for the <laughs> right. The band doesn't play any stuff from this album live anymore ever since it was released. Right. Uh, it was an Al pro uh, Bouchard project but the label didn't like uh, his vocals uh, and they sort of didn't have any uh, faith in the project. So they said, you know what, why don't we get BOC together again and market it as a BOC record. Uh, it's really heavy. Uh, I am the one you warned me of, which I mentioned before, this is its proper place. Great, great heavy track. 
yeah. uh, Les Invisibles is great. In the Presence of Another World, which is actually written. Uh, there's a cool demo also floating on YouTube, uh, Joe Bouchard's demo that I think uh, from the Spectre sessions, uh, which is kind of even spacier uh, than the one on this version. Uh, you mentioned the siege and investiture of Baron von Frankenstein's castle at Wasseria, which is one of the great all time uh, uh, song titles, right? Yeah, and it has that great dramatic, uh, the horses are dazed. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I, I just really like this record. I just think it's, it's, it's sort of like perfectly encapsulates, aside from the early era, right, and everything above it on my list, uh, I think. I think it's a great encapsulation of the kind of Blue Oyster Cult. But also, approach. it's it's hyper dramatic and very cinematic. I mean, everything about it is just it screams out. Somebody needs to put this on film. You know, it's just yeah. the whole thing is like just so huge. It's like Cecil B. DeMille does heavy metal. Um, yeah, you get lost in the sort of the concept, which is right. kind of vague and opaque, right? Um, the songs are not sequenced the way that they were supposed to be, yeah. so that the label sort of came up with this ad hoc, like uh, it it's has, a access. Uh, history. It's amazing right? artwork. It's also, yeah. it looks great. Yeah. I mean, great. It's, Gorgeous. You want to visit that castle. And, I, and I'm looking forward to Al Bouchard's uh, sort yes. of Reimaginos, yes. where he Everybody sort of will, will reimagine Al Bouchard, song. right, is doing an acoustic version the way Sandy Perlman would have wanted it done. So everybody can check that out. It's we'll, called we'll, Reimaginos. I'll come back and we'll talk about that. We are going to talk about it because we both have it on pre order. Yeah. So, all right. That's my number five. That's your number five. I guess I'm I'm actually down to my four now. Okay, okay. so uh, all right, we're gonna have to go with. Uh, I I hate to even have to rank them at this point because these are all it's like it's like picking your children. It's like Sophie's Choice. But here we go, Cultosaurus Erectus, just a phenomenal record. Can't say enough good things about this album. This is the metal BOC album. This is the one that opens up with one of the great goofy but awesome heavy metal songs, which is Black Blade, which has that great riff, the cascading like keyboards, and it's Eric Bloom playing the character of the reluctant warrior who has to chop everybody's head off and doesn't really want to do it. Um, and there's all that great special effects with the foolish humans thing at the end. I just, I just love that song. Um, and then you have stuff on this that's just crazy, like monsters with, you know, the saxophone solo. And you have like some of the great uh, Blue Oyster Cult songs, Lips in the Hills, mm. which is about sex, but we won't get into that. Um, Lips in the Hills, uh, I mean, I just, is there a bad song on this album? I don't, no. I can't, yeah. I mean, I listened to this one like all the way through on numerous occasions and I just love it. So this is definitely in my top four. So this is my number yep. four. Over to you. All right. Well, my number four is an album you mentioned. It's uh, Fire of Unknown Origin. Of Unknown Origin. Right? The title track comes back to the Agents of Fortune sessions, right? Which And they sort of retooled it for this one. Yeah. Martin Birch's production here is gorgeous. It's got their great hit, Burning For You. But for me, my favorite tracks are Veteran of the Psychic Wars. Yes. Which is just like great. The drums, everything. Oh, fantastic. Um, and I love Vengeance the Pack. The funny story behind that is that um, the, that song was written for uh, that movie Heavy Metal, one of the episodes, and right. it was rejected from that from by the makers of that movie because it basically told the entire story of that um, whatever fifteen minute sort of segment in whatever however long the song is like four minutes or something like that. So they couldn't right. use it right because yeah. it basically told the <laughs> told the entire story. So yeah. they ended up using Better of the Psychic Wars, which is like this great moody track. Uh, Joan Crawford is just like one of the all time best. And also Joan Crawford, Crawford has one of the great surrealist lyrics, the whole thing. Yeah, it's just fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I just love this record. So it's my number four. Uh, it's a great, I mean, if, if, if somebody sort of would ask me what's a great BOC record to start with, I would point them to this one because it has hits and it also has great deep tracks and there's a consistency about it that I think is really sort of fantastic. So that's my number four. Yep. All right, so now we're to the top three for me. And it's no coincidence that every one of the top three are all that's left, which is what we call the black and white era, which I consider to be Blue the Cult's greatest era. And this is very difficult for me. Uh, the top two go back and forth all the time, but I guess the third one, um, I've actually changed this recently. So the third one is now going to be Turning Mutation. Mm, wow. Um, and this is an album that it, took me the longer time 
to fully appreciate its its brilliance when it came to the black and white era because the other two I'd always ranked above it. Um, and this is also one of those albums where almost everybody is more familiar with side one than side two. And side two is where things get really interesting. So that's where you have like Baby Ice Dog, Wings Wetted Down, there's the first Patti Smith lyric. Um, and it's a just it's just a great, weird, uh, also everything that you love about the Easter called about the esoteric lyrics. So, you know, there's wings of the black horsemen and flocks of birds and and everything about it. and also this has the definitive blue oyster called album cover just the concentric mm -hmm. rings the pyramid the symbol it's it's dark it's evil it's weird you don't know what the hell is going on and you're like in the presence of something very unique and very special um and it's sort of it's heavy also this is the first blue oyster called album that's it's only the second one but it's a huge improvement over the first production wise so it's no longer drums from Mars or underwater. You can actually hear everything. It's not a great production. It's a little on the raw side, but it works perfectly for the material. And it also has one of the great sly, very amusing uh, Blue Oyster Cult songs, which is Seven Screaming Diz Busters. Which yes. is, you know, the whole song about Eric Bloom and Lucifer and Lucifer the Light. And this was an absolute barnstormer live. So it's just a phenomenal record. Um, and that's my, that's my number three. My number three is Cultosaurus erectus, uh -huh. already mentioned by you. And speaking of um, symbols, right, the, the the BOC sort of sort of symbol, you can barely see it. Yep, but it's, it's that little of, tiny uh, on the little on the little plane going underneath it. <laughs> right there somewhere. <laughs> it's almost as hard to find as the hubcap on the UFO album. Yeah, it's 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 just. I mean, I I just you know we'll just say the same thing that you said. I mean, it's a great record. Uh, it was sort of like a, a sort of envisioned as a response to Mirrors. Mirrors was sort of their bid for commercial success. It didn't really work. Right. Uh, EV was kind of a minor hit, but it didn't really do anything for the band. No. It sort no, of came Mirrors, back. Mirror, Mirrors, Mirrors was a, was a misstep. They were going for a, a commercial, and it didn't really deliver. This actually sold a lot better than Mirrors would. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, it's. I, Deadline is a really great sort of moody track. Deadline is Mad fantastic. Monsters. There's also the, the Ayatollah song, which is fantastic, uh, Divine Wind. Yeah, I love Monsters. I love the sort of the, 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 the saxophone and stuff the like that. The continuity of the saxophone, yes. Um, Unknown Tongue is a really great quirky Unknown sort of Tongue, track. which is actually about menstruation and yeah. Catholic girls. So I guess uh -huh. the cult for Jewish boys had something to do because we're really into Catholic girls. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I really love this record. I think it's, I think it's really strong. Uh, it's sort of like... Um, the less commercial, sort of more serious uh, version of Fire of Unknown Origin, right? Fire, Fire of Unknown Origin is sort of more commercial, more successful. This is a kind of a similar kind of album yeah. in the sense that it's like also kind of heavy, uh, heavy on the sci-fi themes, heavy musically. It's also, uh, also the more, fun. it's the more metal album. Yeah, and, and I, I, just, I just really love it. I think at this time, uh, BOC went on tour with Black Sabbath uh, around this time uh, and, and the Black and the Blue tour, right? Uh, right. And uh, by all intents and purposes, based on sort of like uh, uh, reading sort of uh, testimonies, right? Uh, BOC basically were phenomenal live at this point. So this is, I think this is BOC at the, at the height of their powers. Yeah, and right? we're hoping somebody out there will properly release the Black and Blue film, which has been blocked for years. That's a whole other story. All right. All right. So number two. Number two. Uh, number two is the debut. And there's a few reasons for that. So, so number one. Um, because uh, Boys to Cult in their current incarnation very recently uh, released a live album from a couple of years ago back uh, where they played this album in, in, in its entirety in full. It was for a 40th anniversary concert in London. So it's regarded with a certain amount of iconic status as the first album. There are problems with it, however, as much as I love it and it's my second favorite BOC album, it is the most poorly produced BOC album. But as I've argued for years, it's a poor production that doesn't necessarily harm the mystique of the album. Um, there's something very cold and evil about this record and uh, something about that sort of tin can production. I always say the drums sounds like Alice playing them from Mars and somebody was recording them on a transistor radio from another planet. Um, and he was banging on some wet card board. Um, but it's kind of cool and distant and everything about the album it just very much conjures up a time and a place, which is a very twisted Southern California in the 70s with bad dope deals, aliens just bad stuff, Conroy's Bar. There's all sort of all these characters that flit in and out of Blue Easter Cult songs. And I always, whenever I listen to this album, I'm always like, what's going on at Conroy's Bar? What's happening with that dope deal, Last Days of May, that dope deal out in the desert where everybody got shot? 
Um, and by the way, that's the prettiest song on the album. And it's still totally evil. It's about like a bunch of guys are getting murdered in the desert. And you're listening to it and you're like, this is pretty. It could be like, a, you know, Jackson Brown song, um, which, you know, is also the other thing is there's still little traces in this record of DOC stock forest avocado mafia roots, which is that they began as like, you know, hippy dippy, uh, sort of mellow California rock. And then they were told by the record label, like we briefly touched on before, if they wanted to get a record deal, they needed to heavy that shit up. And so they got Eric Bloom and we got Louis the Cult. Um, so anyway, there's just nothing on this album that I don't like. I love the image. And also this has the kind of album cover that if you were stoned back in the day, you could probably disappear into this album cover. There's just something about those rows. You're just like, <laughs> that's my number two. All right. Well, my number two is Tyranny and Mutation. Uh, great record. Uh, I love the sort of the conceptual nature of it. I love the sort of like the heavy side one and the sort of more side red and side black. Yeah, the more eccentric and, and odd side too. Um, Red in the Black is a great sort of redo of uh, I'm on the Land, but I ain't no, ain't no, no from the debut, right? Uh, Seven Screaming Dustbusters uh, is just like one of these great epics. And it always sort of amused me that it's act exactly seven minutes long, right? So this is sort of almost like this numerological. Yeah, so I never even know that you're right. Seven Screaming Dustbusters, seven minutes. Yeah, uh, I think I love side two more than I love side one. Uh, I, I love side two more now. When I first yeah. first listened to the record, I was a side one guy. Now I'm a side two guy. Yeah, Baby's I mean, um, down, Baby Ice Dog. For me, for me, Mistress of the Salmon Soul. I mean, for me, the, my favorite track on the album is Seven Screaming Dizbusters. Yeah, Seven Screaming Dizbusters is my favorite, but my second favorite is Mistress of the Salmon Salt because it's got that really cool, cryptic sort of storytelling uh, aspect to it. Yeah, and it has uh, a great chorus. Quick line, girl. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's just a great record through and through. It's, it's such a uh, an improvement over the debut, right? The debut is great, but this sort of like raised uh, sort of uh, the ante, right? It, it, it's just that the band is oh, playing. Well, uh, you know, absolutely. It is better. It's just you know, it's, it's much stronger record. No argument there, produced. especially you know, even though I might you know rank the other one higher, it's a much better produced record. It sounds better. Uh, there's a little bit of bottom end there. Um, and it's also got some heavy songs that really benefit from that bottom end because we thought we briefly touched on Joe Bouchard earlier, but one of Joe's like probably his greatest like heavy metal number is on here, which is uh, you know the the uh, Hot Rails to Hell. It's like a great ripping like metal number, and that's a Joe Bouchard song. Mm -hmm. All right. Looks like we're headed for number one, and I got a feeling we're going to be in agreement on this one. <laughs> Secret treaties, right? Secret treaties. Yeah. Can't really beat that one, folks. So I guess I'll start quick. Uh, this is just an amazing record. I mean, I have certain connections to this that maybe some people don't, which is that I'm a huge World War II uh, buff. So immediately when I saw this cover, the ME-262, and also this is a good chance to talk about uh, one of the most fascinating aspects of Blues to Cult, which is that they were, you know, nice Jewish boys from Long Island uh, that flirted with, uh, you know, fascist and Nazi imagery in a very subversive and fascinating way. And that's where you get the peak of that is this album where you have them on the on the cover with the you know the most infamous German jet and the inside has this incredibly disturbing uh, the back cover is this incredibly disturbing why are the German shepherds dead what happened so you're trying to figure out what exactly went down on this mission um, but anyway let's get to the songs so. I once had a, a, a debate with somebody about what's the worst song on the album. And they're all so good that the worst song on the album is still a great song. And that's Cagey Cretans, which is yeah. kind of a silly little poppy number. But, you know, the rest of the album, you've got just insanely good stuff like ME-262. You have Astronomy, which is the great uh, early Blue Oyster Cult ballad. It's probably their definitive early ballad. Um, is there, is there, I'm going to let John take over a little bit here, but I mean, I'm just going through Flaming Telepaths. Well, I was going to say Flaming Telepaths is a great sort of like that synthesizer that sort of comes in in the, in the middle of that song. It's like this synthesizer great synthesizer that comes like, in the middle. Warm sound. Amazing. And this has my, <clears throat> you know, my all time favorite Blues to Cult song, which is Dominance and Submission, which is such a deeply strange. Yeah. To, to this day, <clears throat> excuse me, still can't figure out exactly what the hell that song is about, but it's really cool. Yeah, it's and I love how the the songs sort of like melt into each other, right? I mean, the, the, yeah, I love that. Like, like this, the, 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 it's almost like it's very science fiction. 
Um, yeah, but like, I, I know, love how it all flows, right? Um, it's it's such a strong record. I mean, uh, it's really hard to, um, to 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 really critique it because everything is on such a high level. Um, yeah. I don't know. I've subhuman. I really love right as this sort of like it, it's got this kind of interesting sort of atmosphere. I guess uh, if you want to talk about the live albums, right? Uh, we'll do that at the very end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like there's a great live version of that of that from this time period, right? Um, Harvester of Eyes, really creepy. I love the sort of the outro with the sort of like the really fast sort of like talking. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's my favorite BOC record. I just think it's, it's, it's a great sort of culmination of the early period and it would sort of lead into the kind of band that they would become where they would sort of, you know, it's much more accessible yeah. than the first two records. It's, uh, but it's, it's also- more accessible than the first two records, but uh, it's also, uh, I think the album where they really uh, it's the peak of the cohesiveness for the yeah. sort of uh, fascist imagery, the transgressive. You know, when you talk about blue, the early blues, the cult was very transgressive. Yeah. And this is the, the peak of that. It's also where you can feel like, you know, huge amounts of like sort of that creative brain trust from, you know, the, uh, you know, sort of intellectual intelligentsia of, you know, New York culture you know that sort of like art culture lower downtown new york um you know all these crazy richard Meltzer and all these sort of crazy you know intellectuals that were putting out like you know transgressive comics and art and all this stuff and it all sort of comes together they're all sort of contributing so it's this huge melting pot but it really coheses uh, it's very cohesive and uh the imagery the, the album cover the song titles the way they were dressing i mean they were all dressing like they were nazis which is hilarious when you think about it um, you know, they were wearing the coats and whatever. Um, and, you know, people don't realize, but this was an era where BOC on stage were a little scary. You know, there were like the mirrored shades, you know, Eric Bloom's whole image was very, oh, you know, intimidating. Um, the, they have the, the, that would have been a wild concert to see in the 70s. Patti Smith's great sort of lyrics on Career of Evil, right? It's kind of subversive lyrics. Uh, yeah, Patti well, Smith, the, the Patti Smith lyrics is fantastic. She's yeah, a great yeah. Lyrics, yeah. So, so we agree, number one. We agree. It's just Secret anybody, if, and if anybody came to me and said, I've never heard Boys to Cult, what should I start with? Start with Secret Treatments. Mm. All right. Um, and so I think to end the show, we're just going to very quickly go through, we're just this classic period, we'll just quickly go through the live albums. And uh, Boys to Cult really did three um, for that period. I have a feeling we're going to rank them similarly, I'd imagine. Yeah, I, I don't think this is this is generally... This is something that has a lot of, so I mean, I'll just do, why don't I go first and I'll do my three and then you do all three. So yeah. my, my, num, my, my least favorite, and it's still a good record, is Extraterrestrial Live. Mm -hmm. And uh, for my personal thing on that one is that this was the, one of the first rock concerts that I went to. I saw them on this tour, just missed Al Bouchard because Rick Downey was the first tour that Rick Downey did. Um, so it's a good record. It does you know, songs from Fire of Unknown Origin and Cult of Source Erectus, so it's good to hear those songs live. Um, also, for trivia buffs, there's a couple of songs on here that do have Al Bouchard on, on drums. They were the last things to be recorded with the band. And one of those is, of course, Dominance and Submission, which is one of my all-time favorites. So it's good to hear that. I actually like that version of Dominance and Submission almost even better than the version on the... It's, a very on good, it's also a good very audio. Yeah, very, very, very heavy version. And I also love on this one, the, the cover of Roadhouse Blues is really fun on this okay. one, right? Roadhouse Blues is very fun. But yeah, but they, Bob Speaker plays on it. And he also, he's one of, the, one of those people that actually contributed to Imaginos, along with Joe Satriani. Oh, right, right Robbie Krieger, that's right. Yeah. That's correct. So uh, but of the three, it's, it's my least favorite. But, and at the time when it came out, it seemed a little superfluous. It's sort of like we need another book. But I'm glad we have it. And it's, it sounds good remastered in the box set. All right, um, number two. I guess you do the second one. Number two, yeah. Some Enchanted Evening. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Um, yeah, I love the kind of gate, gate, gatefold action here. The gatefold on this is phenomenal. And I will say the most important salient thing on this album is that when it originally came out, it was a huge, huge seller, but a little disappointing to the fans because it was a single album, only had seven songs, and we were sort of like, you know, and it was like a live album after two studio albums. Uh, you know, they had just done Spectres and Agents of Fortune. I guess they were catching in a Milky the Reaper. But mm -hmm. all that aside, the version that is now sold is a vastly superior. It's expanded. Now it has, I think, 10 or 11 tracks um, and a DVD. Um, so it's become like this essential thing. And they put in a couple of older songs. I guess they didn't want to repeat any of the black and white songs. But you get a couple of those repeated here, but they sound great. 
So now it is absolutely worth. Um, and I like I like the covers on this one too. We got to get out of this place by the animals. The covers are very good. Take out the jams. Yeah. Uh, kind of goofy. And it has <laughs> the most iconic album cover of the DOC from that era. Plus Great. The horseman. I, I love the version of astronomy on this. The version yeah, on astronomy of this is just like amazing. Fantastic. Great so outro. Number one, I'd be shocked if we don't. Yeah, we know. We know what's left. This one. Oh, the CD <laughs> fell out. Um, I put all my mini LPs in, in Japanese sleeves. This yeah. also has cool, which we forgot about, is the, the, the inside. Demo, yeah, like, it's a great sort of like 70s live album right i mean it's <laughs> uh it, it's it's got that great version of subhuman that i mentioned before which sort of stretches it out to like seven about seven or so about minutes. to seven minutes and i remember being with both john and i being impressed at the time when we first heard it and we were like oh the balls of like opening a concert with this sort of moody well it turns out that like it, it was selectively edited for the live album and actually uh, there's a very good fan edit, which adds a couple of songs. The opening track was actually Workshop with the Telescopes. But when they were cutting vinyl, they couldn't fit it on. So for years, I thought that Blue Earth Circle opened their 1975 tours with Submission, the Subhuman. And I was like, wow, that's a ballsy move. Like all these stone kids all amped up. Blue Earth Circle come on stage and just go. Whoa. And I was like, that's not the way it really happened. <laughs> but it, it still makes it interesting to listen to um, as, as an album. It does have some deficiencies, which I happen to like. It's not that the production isn't that great. It's pretty raw. Uh, my favorite comment from Martin Popoff was he said his original copy still smells like incense. Um, <laughs> it's, sort of, evil, it's an evil record. I mean, it's sort of comparable to the debut in that the, the debut in that way. The sense that the, the, the debut is also kind of poorly produced, but it kind of adds to like the atmosphere. Adds to the, the record atmosphere, charm, right? Same it, thing here. I mean, if you saw that in your driveway, you'd be shitting a brick. <laughs> so, you know, it's like just the hearse. And, you know, you open it up and it's, you know, it's, it's like it's the original vinyl was done like a Bible and had like a little, uh, the little uh, satin bookmark. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it feels like you're reading, you know, yeah, the is. Bible uh, <laughs> and the black gloves. So you have to also put this in the, in the, in the context of when it was released. So this is 1975. Occultism is very much in the air. The Exorcist wasn't that long ago. Uh, you know, it's like the era of the Exorcist and Satanism and popular culture and Charles Manson and black gloves and you know, so it's super freaky seventies occultist. Yeah, it's it's it. I mean, it's a great sort of uh, like an like a like an end of an era, right? Right before Agents of Fortune. It's sort of like it puts it puts a great sort of like exclamation point or like a period at the end of that sort of yeah. three, and amazing. It, and three it's like the, the covers are. The covers are like, you know, like, 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 you know, evil sounding 60s, you know, born to be wild, but it's a little off. Uh, you know, so. And I ain't got you. I ain't yeah. got you, which, which, which had the subtitle Mas Masterati GT. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, just a, just a great live album. So, uh, and we will, and I'm sure John will be back for this. We will be reviewing the new Boys to Cult, which comes out, I believe, uh, either a week or two weeks from now, but we're coming up on a pre -stage. Yeah, this was fun. And also, yeah. don't forget Al's, Albert's new solo record about Reimagino. Yeah, I, mean, I would suggest everybody, any of these albums that we've discussed, by all means, check it out on YouTube. Everything is on YouTube, and there is an Albert Chard. Uh, Reimagino's coming, where we will get Imagino's done in a way that Sandy Perlman probably will appreciate. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Also, Joe Bouchard has a solo record that is is pretty new, that name escaped me, but I'll make sure I mention it on the next show. Uh, I would Google all these guys. Also, when you get it, if you get a chance and you want to buy these kinds of things, by all means, check out, if you don't know about it, check out Bandcamp because you can get bundles and things from them. And uh, it's also a way to support artists and give them a little bit more of your money directly. So if you want to help Al like, buy some more groceries, buy the album from Bandcamp. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is uh, this is Horace Cordier and you've been watching Rock in a Hard Place. This is our first episode. And it's with my, with my friend, John, he will definitely be back. Right. Stay cool, stay heavy, and we will see you later. Da, 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 da.